everybody, I'm just welcoming you all. Um, just so that you know, this will be recorded. So um, we ask that if you could keep your microphones muted just for the presentation part, there will be an opportunity to unmute yourself and possibly even um, take your video off if you prefer, but for your own privacy and um, just to ensure that um, we respect everyone's privacy, we just ask that you keep your microphone muted for sure and, um, and your video being up to you could stay on or off. Um, so let's get started. Um, so I've mentioned about the recording um, and our privacy. We want to ensure that you feel safe and supported here this evening. So please note that there will be the crisis line available in the chat feature, um, as well as the rocks, rocks access line, um, should you require it. Um, you will see me looking off to another screen and that's because I'm kind of doing a couple of things and making sure that I admit everybody in from the waiting room as we get started. Um, so I'd like to, at this point, um, just introduce to you our chat moderator. So if I can get the next slide. Um, so our co-facilitator and chat monitor this evening is Christina. So if you would like to send a message or a question or a thought or just something you'd make sure that we would mention to our presenter, um, go ahead and send it to Christina. Um, you can, near the end, um, you can send it to me as well. Um, send it to both of us, whichever one you feel comfortable with. We want to make sure you're heard and involved. Um, so at this point, um, we are going to read a land acknowledgement, which is just a little something um, that we're going to um, share with you as we, first of all, fully become mindful of where we are. Um, so just would like you all to take a moment and allow yourself to fully arrive. We are honored to welcome you at our event this evening. Allow the dust to settle in your mind. Bring your attention to your body, your breath, this present moment. Inhale a deep breath and exhale slowly. You are here and welcome. Our program runs in the region of Halton. We would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. In particular, we acknowledge the traditional territory of the Neutral, the Hodoni Notione, and the Anishine Bay peoples. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular, and our province and country as a whole. Thank you for registering for this workshop. With the, and with us this evening, <laughs> sorry, thank you for registering for this workshop with us this evening. There's so much to share. <laughs> My name is Maria Rosa, and I am the lead volunteer for Halton's Families for Families for the workshops. Um, Halton Families for Families is a community collaborative that is here to support you and your family. We are volunteer parents and caregivers who partner with community organizations to organize events, workshops, and socials where you can connect with other families and feel supported and comfortable as a family. Please also feel free to check out our website, www.haltonfamiliesforfamilies.com. It's also in the chat for you. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our workshop. Part one, Achieving Healthy Sleep and Stress Management. This evening's presentation will be led by Heather Dranger, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, from Support Therapy. Heather is an occupational therapist that has worked in the mental health field for a number of years. She has worked at the Oakville Hospital in the inpatient adult and adolescent programs, and then at the outpatient mental health program. Her experience also includes work at the Seniors Community Mental Health Program and the Assertive Community Treatment Team at Trillium Health Sciences. Heather took some time off to raise her young family and now continues to see clients virtually 
at her private practice to support therapy. She volunteers because you know, she doesn't have enough. <laughs> Very busy lady. She volunteers at St. Vincent de Paul and enjoys long walks through the trails with her dog. She also loves playing board games and cards with her family. To refuel, she meditates, does yoga, reads, and enjoys a good cup of tea. Heather, welcome. We are happy to have you join us this evening. Take it away. Thank you, Maria Rosa. That was well done. <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming to, share. <laughs> coming to the sleep um, session. I'm hoping I don't let you fall asleep and you will actually get away with some tidbits and help you on your way to a better productive uh, sleep life. So my objectives um, for today is to go over the importance of sleep for our overall health. Uh, kind of go through the stages of sleep and have you understand why it's so important. And then uh, look at sleep hygiene and uh, how to improve your sleep. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll go through how you have to be aware of the different energy types that could cause uh, sleep disturbances. And finally, we'll end up with some discussion. So starting off right away, um, I just wanted to say that sleep, there's a lot of studies, if you really want to research it, it plays a vital role in our mental and physical well-being. Uh, it allows our bodies and brains to recover during the night, and a good night rest ensures that you feel refreshed and alert uh, when you wake up in the morning. And the term sleep deficiency, which I'm going to sort of focus on, really refers to our inability to get enough high-quality sleep. Um, this may occur due to sleep deprivation or simply not getting enough sleep. Or there may be an underlying reason such as uh, sleep disorder or circadian rhythm misalignment. And I'll explain all of those details as we go along. A lack of high quality sleep really means your body has less time to recover during the night. And this can then lower your body's defenses uh, against diseases. So starting off, we're gonna talk about the cognitive impact on sleep. When we don't get a good night's sleep, it really does affect our memory and our concentration because uh, we tend to make more mistakes at work and at school and even with uh, driving. Uh, when you can't concentrate it, uh, you know, and you can't learn new skills, you can imagine what that must be like for uh, various people on, on a job or at school. But I won't get into the schools part because I know Dr. Coons is going to discuss that uh, later on this week. Um, and memory consolidation is uh, really a process that's required during our sleep time. Uh, during the third stage of sleep, which is what we call a deep sleep, and I'll explain that again a little bit more detail, but your brain begins to organize and consolidate all the memories. Um, as a result, when you um, don't get enough sleep, it affects your ability to remember important details. And um, there was a study done recently on mice where they had them in a space with a food box. And when the mice uh, approached and they realized where the food box was, they took the mice out and they allowed them to have like a normal sleep pattern and reintroduced different items in the food box. And when they put the mice back in that area, in the space, the mice remembered and they went straight to the food box without any issues. Um, there was an, then they took the same set of mice and they, uh, you know, had them uh, sleep deprived. So when they came back into the box um, with all the different obstacles, these, these mice didn't actually remember where the food box was and they had to go and smell and kind of refigure out everything. So um, you can just imagine how, how important um, memory is for us on, on a regular basis. And, you know, we see that with the aging process as people are aging and they're not getting enough sleep or it's fragmented sleep, it really does impact on different illnesses like Alzheimer's disease and different memory issues. So there's a, still a lot of research going into it, but we do know it does, you know, it has a big impact on our memory. Um, then it also, sleep really has an impact on our mood as anyone can can attest when we don't get enough sleep, we get a little short tempered and uh, we don't tend to uh, deal with other people as well. 
um, we, you know, um, we tend to get a little bit more irritable and frustrated easily. So I think that kind of will lead sometimes to health issues. And, and there are studies that show, you know, sleep uh, deprivation also leads to depression. Uh, the physical impact of sleep is um, we've seen the, the studies that show the um, obesity, where studies show when you're, you're not getting enough sleep, there are two hormones that are produced uh, in our bodies. One is ghrelin, and that makes sure that you feel hungry, uh, whereas leptin gives you that satiety feeling, so you're feeling like you're full. Uh, a lack of sleep can impact and cause your ghrelin levels to increase and your leptin levels to decrease, which means um, you're likely to feel um, hungrier and you will, in fact, overeat. So that kind of leads to the obesity. Um, there are, like I said, lots of studies and we still don't know all the details, but they're still figuring it out. Um, there's also studies that show heart problems and blood pressure is related to a lack of sleep and um, insulin management as well, where sleep deprivation can affect how your body reacts to insulin and cause your glucose levels to rise, which in turn puts you at a higher risk for developing type two diabetes. Um, also your immuno health, uh, during sleep, there's a peak uh, time when a certain amount of um, T cells or your sort of um, immune system cells are produced. And when you're not getting enough sleep, you tend to run the gamut and um, you know, have less of that being produced. As a result, you get chronic inflammation throughout the body and that can uh, lead to some chronic medical conditions as well. Um, just to overall, it's, it's good to know that um, in the 1950s, adults were getting an average of eight hours of sleep a day, which is the recommended level between seven to nine hours of sleep. And in today's society, the average adult is getting six and a half hours of sleep. So what happened um, over that time period, we're not sure, but it seems like humans are the only ones that are willing to sacrifice um, and do without sleep. Um, like we opt for another cup of coffee as opposed to taking a power nap during the daytime. And um, we'll like Netflix throughout the night as opposed to just shutting it down when we're tired and uh, listening to our bodies. So there's still a lot to learn about sleep. And um, what we do know so far are the basics as far as the stages of sleep are concerned. And this is for all the parents out there. This is not the stages of sleep I'm talking about because we've all been through this. So we're talking about the sleep cycle. And stage one, this is usually your, you know, the initial stage where you're getting drowsy and you're just starting to fall asleep. It lasts for about seven minutes. And um, there are what theta waves, which is like a relaxing when you're in um, uh, meditation mode <clears throat> and it, everything slows down, your muscles relax, your heart rate slows down, your breathing relaxes and your eye movements are really slowing down as well. Um, you know that sense when you're drifting and you feel like you're suddenly falling and then you wake up and you jerk out of it? There's actually a, a scientific name for that and it's called hypnic myoclonia uh, or we call it hypnic jerks. And that's pretty common to happen. And that's, um, uh, however, sometimes with stress and um, excessive sort of things going on in your life, those can be triggered more so than normal. So this is, once again, stage one, is just the easy drifting off stage and we're easily awakened by other sort of movements or external happenings. Stage two, this is sort of a slightly deeper sleep. Um, this lasts for about 25 to 30 minutes. We actually spend 50% of our sleep time in stage two and um, your heartbeat starts to relax and slow down along with your breathing and your brain activity actually slows down here as well. You do get some sort of, you see these sleep spindles and the K complex uh, wave patterns. And those are just thought to be associated with trying to get you into deeper sleep, even with external stimuli. So it makes sure your body is a little bit more rested at this stage. <clears throat> 
And this is the stage, the stage three, which is your deep sleep. And we'd all love to be here for as long as we can, because this is the, the time when um, growth hormone is secreted in our body. And that kind of helps us with all the micro tears we get throughout the day from everything that we do. So it helps recover for, you know, recovery for muscle and bone and even for bone growth here. Uh, this is the slowest breathing pattern you're going to have. Your heart rate is completely relaxed along with your muscles. And um, you have the delta waves, which are extremely slow. Um, and this is going to be a hard time for you to wake up out of. Um, this, is, uh, this actually happens a lot in the first part of the sleep patterns that we sleep cycles that we have. And it's then taken over by the REM sleep. And for those of you who know, a REM sleep is rapid eye movement. And this is where the brain is the most active. And REM sleep starts about 90 minutes after your first stage one, and then it increases throughout the period. Your brain waves are very similar to being when you're active and awake. Uh, a lot of dreaming occurs here, your breathing increases, your blood pressure goes up. However, your muscles are paralyzed, so you don't act out your dreams. Um, there's a lot of learning and memory storage and sorting and mood regulation that's happening during your REM sleep. Um, so it makes sense that newborns experience 80% of their time at this stage because there's a lot of like um, memory and consolidating of information happening versus adults, which we only spend about 25% of our time in this stage. So you can see what the sleep stage looks like. So this is the awake period at the very top. And then we kind of go down into N1, which is our stage one. And then we go deeper into stage two, which is your intermediate stage. And then you can see this is the three red areas. That's your deep sleep. Oops. And with the deep sleep, that sort of only happens in the first part of your sleep cycle. And then you kind of go up, up into stage two, which is your intermediate sleep. And then over here, this is your first REM, which is your first sort of dreaming state. And that doesn't last for very long. And then you go through the cycle again. And then you can see it gets a little longer. And then up here, you can see as you're waking up, later in the day or in your sleep cycle, you actually wake up out of a dream state. So that's a lot of the times you'll remember a dream and that's usually the only dream unless you're waking up sort of in between here, you can see somebody's kind of woken up during a dream state. So um, that's sort of happening. You can see the first stage where your deep sleep, where your recovery of your muscles happen and your physical recovery is only in the first part of your cycle. So I'm going to stop here. If there are any questions, I'm open to taking them. No? Okay, so we'll go on. So what really affects our sleep? For a lot of us, we're having problems sleeping um, and you know we're not sure why this is happening. But one of the main reasons is, uh, well, you, you feel like your day is starting backwards, right? <laughs> where you wake up tired and you go to sleep awake. But um, it's called the circadian rhythm. And basically, um, circadian is um, circle around the day. So it's a rhythm, uh, it follows a 24 hour cycle. And it, it really talks about how we follow the sun cycle. Um, so right here in the, um, during this, uh, in the brain, it's, uh, there's a, in the hypothalamus, there's a special area called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and I'll just say SCN from now on. And that's basically composed of uh, 20,000 um, nerve cells that regulate the brain activity based on certain things. And one of the things that it really is affected by is the um, sunlight. So SCN relies on light to directly if affect our sleep wake cycle. Um, when you're in the daylight, it shows an increased level of alertness and energy. It when it becomes dark, the SCN stimulates the release of a hormone called melatonin. 
and that prepares your body to kind of shut down and slow down. So that's why it's so important if you are having any problems with your sleep cycle to try to get out and get some fresh uh, sunlight right away. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the sleep hygiene perspective. Um, so it's uh, most people have a natural inclination to being awake at certain times. And it's a concept known as chronotype. So um, there's a morning chronotype um, where you have an internal alarm clock that makes it difficult to sleep in. And no matter what you try to do, you'll always be one of those people that will wake up before your alarm goes off. You know, you're an AM uh, chronotype. And then there's the evening uh, chronotype, which is they have a tough time going to bed early. And, you know, they just they really need um, the alarm clock to wake them up first thing in, in the morning because they won't do it by themselves. And they'll always try to time things. So just so they get out of bed just in time to to get things done. So they're always a little rushed first thing in the morning. Um, it's good to know that chronotype is adjustable to kind of if you tend to be one of the evening chronotypes and you have an early morning um, expectation, it's it, you know, just know that you will uh, you can shift it. And uh, even though your chronotype is dependent on your genetics and your lifestyle, it changes over time and we can affect it by changing our rhythms as well. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to go into uh, strategies to help uh, improve your sleep. So like I said earlier, with regard to the uh, circadian rhythm, it's really important to get out and get some sunlight, usually within 30 minutes of waking up, because that really stimulates your brain center to get uh, revved up for energy and your daily cycle. Um, it's also important at nighttime to be aware of the fact that your, the blue light that we get from screens does stimulate your brain, especially the SCN uh, center and um, it, that will promote you to kind of stay awake. That's why we really recommend you stay away from screens of any sort uh, in the evening, just because it, it starts to stimulate your brain uh, in the wake cycle. So if you can't stay away from the screens, then uh, look at blue blocking glasses or just try to minimize your time when you're getting closer to bed. Um, the other thing you can do is also have a really good wind down routine and studies are showing time and time again now that uh, relaxation routines before going to bed is really key to settle our whole nervous system down and um, you can do something like um, uh, deep breathing, which is, you know, taking in, uh, in inhalation for four counts holding it and then exhale, doing an exhalation for six counts. So making it slower and more correct, progressive as you're exhaling, that will actually help stimulate your vagus nerve, which is um, gonna trigger your brain to settle down and calm down. It sort of uh, triggers a relaxation response in your body. Uh, other things that you can do is meditation. And now there are more and more studies showing that when you are actually meditating, you're kind of getting into the brain waves that are calming you down and relaxing you. So you're setting yourself up for a better night's sleep. Uh, a lot of people can use uh, guided imagery to kind of talk them through uh, to relax and even a progressive muscle relaxation techniques, which is uh, kind of going through looking over your body and kind of relaxing each part as you go along. And that has, has significantly got some good results with uh, getting people to relax before they go to bed. And you can also try different techniques like yoga and stretching. Those are all good relaxing ways of kind of stimulating the relax, relaxation response. I like uh, the idea of uh, grounding yourself in gratitude before you go to bed because that's um, a really nice way to stop your mind from kind of running around in circles. Um, if you're just trying to identify, just 
three good things that happened to you today. And it could be anything from uh, a beautiful sunrise to connecting with a friend to listening to your favorite music, just jotting down positive things and knowing that you're going to have to do this like every day in the evening, it gets your mind in general, just focused on the positives around you. And that can only help uh, in your day-to-day -day life as well. Uh, the other idea is to clear your mind. It's, I like uh, journaling every night before I go to bed because it's, uh, it's a good way to physically get all the thoughts that are buzzing around in your head onto paper, especially if you're a type of person that loves to have their to-do list and it's kind of going through your, your mind before you go to bed. You can just put that down in your journal and this way it's out of your head and you know it's down somewhere so you don't have to think about it. And um, if you do you know, have a difficult time, just writing about all your emotions and difficulties on paper gives you a little bit of perspective. And sometimes it, it helps looking at it from different uh, point of view or just getting it out of your head again uh, helps clear your mind. And that sort of helps with the whole relaxing response when you're trying to go to sleep. Uh, breathing intentionally, I talked a little bit about that. Uh, activating your vagus nerve uh, in order to stimulate a relaxation response. Any questions so far? Seem to be still pretty clear. Good. My my unmute wasn't working, so my <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's another aspect. Um, your physical environment plays a huge role in your sleep pattern as well. Um, if you're, you know, if there's light coming through, you're going to stimulate your brain to kind of stay up. Um, and it's actually not just your brain that's affected by light. Believe it or not, um, your red blood cells also are sensitive to light and they can detect the light, the blue light that comes through um, your skin. So for those of us who think, oh, I can, I can lay down and sleep while the TV's on, uh, think about sleeping in the room with that light going and the noise going at you. Um, you may be sleeping, but you may not be getting the best quality sleep. Um, so in addition to, you know, wearing blue blockers before you go to bed, try really darkening your room as much as you can, like wear, um, have blackout curtains. Uh, you know, I know people that put electric tape over their um, alarm clocks or just put a towel over. So you're not getting the lighting from electronic devices. Um, keeping your bedroom cool and quiet is key because once again, when you're trying to go to sleep in that stage one and two, and if there's a lot of noise happening, you'll actually keep coming out of it. So you'll be bouncing back and forth and you won't actually go into um, the, the deep sleep stage where you're receiving a lot of that uh, rejuvenation and, and growth hormone to help recover from all the activities of your day. So really think about quietening your uh, noise around your room. And if you cannot, then just like, if you have someone that snores and you're sleeping with them, put in ear uh, plugs and that might help you as well. Uh, try to keep the room cool. Usually, you know, 65 degrees Fahrenheit is, is it seems a little cold, but your body actually needs that to um, relax and go down in a comfortable state. Uh, create a comfortable bedroom. A mattress and pillow are key here. I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure you have something that's comfortable for you. Um, and, you know, replacing pillows annually is a good idea. Uh, and your, your mattress probably about every five to seven years. Um, it's a good idea because sometimes they kind of get indented with a shape and form. So it's, it's good to, you know, just invest in something that's comfortable. Uh, for those of you who are really having a hard time falling asleep and worrying about, oh, what time is it? Don't watch your clock because that's just going to increase your anxiety and going to make it worse. So just turn your clock around or cover it with a towel. And if it's really getting um, difficult for you to fall asleep, then you don't want to associate the bedroom with anything negative. So just get out of bed, leave the room go do some reading or do an activity that's relaxing for you, whether it's listening to music or doing some artwork, and then come back and hopefully you'll feel a little bit more drowsier and you'll fall asleep. 
turn off Wi-Fi. I know it's uh, pretty <laughs> impossible in today's society to turn off Wi-Fi completely, but definitely turn off your devices before you go to bed. And if possible, don't even bring devices in the bedroom. Um, you know, so it's it's really important because sometimes if you have those devices on and they're, you know, the chimes are going and the alarms are going in the middle of the night and you're going to be awakened by them or some people actually will wake up and respond to <laughs> their texts or whatever it is, probably a good idea just to turn it off completely. So the importance of flowing through all of those uh, sleep cycles is going to only enhance your health in the long run. And once again, just being mindful of what you're eating and drinking and what time you're doing it at as well. So adults in general should have about half their body weight in water in ounces um, for the day. It is important to time your water intake because you don't want to have it too close to the evening or nighttime where you're then going to have to wake up and go to the washroom. So really time it as far as uh, try to avoid drinking more than four to eight ounces just before you go to bed or a couple of hours before you go to bed. And um, keep an eye on your caffeine intake. It's, it's actually um, a vicious cycle, right? You get tired, so you drink the caffeine and then you know the cycle kind of keeps iterating itself because you have to have more and more caffeine just to keep yourself awake. Um, so instead of caffeine, maybe respect your body and just have a power nap instead. And if you are gonna have co coffee just or caffeine in any form of drinks or any food you're eating, just be aware of the half-life that caffeine has in your body. So it has a six hour half-life, meaning that 50% of the caffeine still stays in your body for six hours after you ingest it. Um, so, you know, it really depends on the individual. Some people aren't affected by caffeine, but I know I'm pretty sensitive to caffeine, so I can't have it anytime after noon. If I do, it really does impact my sleep and I get a lot of fragmented sleep. Um, fill up at the right time. So that's really talking about when do you eat? Uh, if you're a late night snacker, that's probably not a good idea. That's going to impact your sleep because um, when you are eating late at night, your body is actually uh, processing the food and, and all of the, the blood flow that should be going to your brain and kind of helping with uh, brain recovery and uh, digest, you know, and uh, muscle recovery is actually going towards digestion. So um, once again, really think about the impact of when you eat and how that's going to impact your sleep pattern as well. Go easy on the alcohol. Um, alcohol, though it may help you wind down, it is not a sleep aid. <clears throat> it's a sedative that leads to sleep fragmentation. So you will wake up multiple times um, over the course of the night, uh, especially it will affect your REM sleep, which is your dream sleep and your um, mood regulation. And it's, it's good for sort of your thinking processes. So uh, really be aware of when you're ingesting your alcohol and try to keep it uh, like don't have any alcohol four hours before you go to bed. Check your medication because sometimes um, they may have an impact on your sleep pattern. Check with your uh, physician or your pharmacist. They're always good to, to give you an idea of how you may change that. Just don't stop your medication. Consult with somebody before you do that. So if we only knew better about coffee. Uh, one other thing, and there are lots and lots of studies that show the, imp the positive impact of exercise that has on our health in general, but exercise really helps improve our sleep quality. It increases the overall amount of time we sleep. It also um, helps you sleep in a, a better and a deep sleep. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you sleep more in that deep sleep, remember the um, growth hormone is secreted and it kind of relaxes your whole body, but it also helps physically repair all the muscle damage throughout the day. Also, we know that aerobic exercise in particular can be effective in um, relieving sleep issues. 
um, for insomnia and sleep apnea. There was a study done where people were given um, moderate intensity aerobic exercise along with strength training, and they had it done over a 12-week period, uh, and their apnea actually improved by 25% uh, in the long run. So um, sleep, you know, exercise also helps with uh, daytime sleepiness, fatigue, and depression. A lot of the times, um, kind of what holds us back from exercising is, you know, some of us may find it boring or not stimulating enough. So really look at ways of you, that, that you can promote exercise in your life, whether if you just want to go out for a walk and, you know, you just want to go for a hike in nature, do that. I mean, that's something we can still do during our lockdown, right, is go for walks in our trails. Um, by all means, like walk, take your, like I take my dog because it kind of pushes, forces me to, to get that exercise or go with my husband for walks every day. It's, um, it's a great way, just get it in for 30 minutes a day and studies show that that's really all you need to help with uh, your health in general. So why not? Just look at uh, different ways of doing it. A lot of people do it online now. Um, I love doing yoga online. I can do it you know, without feeling like I'm being judged by other people in a yoga studio. So why not take the opportunity? We're, we're at home now in lockdown and we have all this time back from not having to travel to work. So take that half an hour that you would have taken on the go train or in your car and, and put it towards uh, exercise routine. So you may have tried all of these uh, techniques and still find it hard to get some good quality sleep. So then, you know, looking at um, what are your sleep problems and how, how is, why is that happening? And maybe we need to go back and look at the psychology behind um, what may cause some of the sleep pattern issues. And so we're looking now at the five energy types that could cause sleep issues. Um, you know, if the demands of life stays the same and the external events stay the same, but you're not getting enough sleep, so your ability to cope is compromised, um, then you're going to have to fill this gap of what the demands are and what you're capable of, and that causes the stress in our life. Um, really just think about being in a chronic state of stress and always worrying about things, always thinking about the what ifs, that's going to impact your sleep pattern as well. So it's kind of like the analogy of um, putting a frog in a in a pot of hot boiling water, as soon as you put it in, it's going to jump out because it realizes it's hot. However, if you place the same frog in a pot of cold water and you turn on the temperature, it's going to actually stew in there and allow itself to be boiled. And it's a little gruel, it's gruesome, but it kind of shows that when you're in a state of chronic stress, you don't even realize you're so stressed because it's, it's just part of your everyday makeup. And so your sleep, um, when it's impacted, may be a, a mirror image of what's actually happening in your life. So maybe taking a step back and just being aware of your pattern. Um, there's a study that was shown that caregivers for people that they were taking care of for over a long period of time were actually uh, more impacted because they took um, some cell biopsies and they found that 20, they, these cells took 25% longer to heal than uh, the control study. So really when we're always in chronic sense of stress and, and um, anxiety, it does impact a lot of the other systems in our bodies. So um, let's just look at some of these five patterns. The first one is the achiever pattern. And this is uh, when we define ourselves by what we have achieved in this world. So we've got the big job, we've got all these big responsibilities, uh, and we're just driven to be busy and do whatever they do to, you know, to the best of their ability. Um, and some people may not see themselves as the achiever pattern because they don't have the big house and the fancy cars. But if you're always busy doing things and, uh, you know, you're just trying to prevent climate change, it's your self-worth that's really focused on achieving and then I'll be enough. Uh, so really looking at that pattern and trying to identify if that's something you can relate to. The other one is the helper pattern. 
where you define your self-worth um, for what we do for other people. So it's that over-responsibility that usually it's the first, the firstborn child that has this kind of pattern. Uh, so to give you an example, you're exhausted, but at the end of the day, you just want to sit on the couch and you know, relax and have a nice shower. And uh, then you get a text from your friend asking for some help and you completely ignore your own body cues and what you need to do for yourself. And you go ahead and you help your friend. Now that's okay, you don't, you know, I'm not telling you not to help your friends. It's okay to do it once or twice, but when it becomes a pattern and you're always doing people favors and you're always putting people's needs ahead of your own, then that's gonna impact you chronically and so you have to take a you know step back and really understand if this is how you manage your life uh, the third pattern is the anxiety pattern and that's um, the underlying sense that this the world is not a safe place to be in we're always worrying and ruminating um, and trying to figure out how we can solve uh, the issues by kind of thinking ourselves to a place of safety and we're always in our heads. So it's the what if thinking, what if this happens and I'll do that? What if that happens and I'll do this? And if you're always in that mode and you're always in your head, you're not gonna actually feel that sense of safety ever because you're always kind of debating what could happen. The perfectionist is uh, similar to the achiever where we, we have to get everything done perfectly. If we don't get it done right, it's a blot on our character and we failed as a person. So once again, it's similar to the achiever pattern uh, in the sense that you're always getting things done. However, the achiever is trying to accomplish something, whereas the perfectionist has to do it perfectly. They're not about achieving, it's just getting it done to the best of their standards. Um, and finally, the controller is once again, similar to the anxiety pattern but the world isn't a safe place so i've got to be in control and they're always taking control of everyone else and making sure they don't show any part of their vulnerabilities to the world so that takes up a lot of energy and so these are just the five patterns that i'd like to uh, highlight because when i've seen um, individuals this is these are the sort of the stress patterns that impact sleep significantly. Uh, so, you know, just being aware of your pattern, being aware of triggers, are there different people that trigger you? Are there certain situations or places that trigger you to kind of get into these um, situa um, patterns? So uh, just being aware of it is part of the, the process, right? So if you see it, you don't have to be it. Um, if you're always in that high anxiety state where there's these beta waves, which are, are sort of awake uh, waves when we're always thinking and processing information uh, and we're not letting our nervous systems relax and go into like the deeper, slower, relaxing waves, it actually, it's like a car sitting at a traffic light with the engine revved up, right? It just keeps going and going and going and you just can't stop. It's, uh, it's burning up a lot of fuel without really uh, getting much accomplished except uh, using up energy for no reason. So it's really important to understand what's holding you back and what's sort of helping or hindering the natural process of you falling asleep. And once you understand your, your pattern, you can learn how to overcome that, the obstacles and really uh, allow sleep to happen. You can retrain your brain. It's not, uh, you know, there's a lot of neuroplasticity that happens in the brain, no matter how old we are. It's not unlike um, having a dog sit on a couch for years at a time, and then you get, you buy a new couch and, and you don't want them on that couch anymore. So it's the same process. You just got to go over and over in your brain. It's, it's going to take some time, but it will eventually happen. So, um, you know, if you can identify with some of these difficulties, you're more than welcome to uh, work with a psychotherapist to explore some of your emotions and find out what's stopping you to kind of achieving your best sleep possible or just learn strategies specifically tailored to you uh, to overcome your sleep quality issues. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for 
coming and attending. I hope you have a little bit, you came away with a little bit more information than you, um, you know, came here with, or you're leaving with a little bit more information. And if there's any questions, I'm open to it. I'm just waiting to see if there's anything posted in the chat. Um, nothing's coming in so far. Um, there's um, a question around hormones. Um, do hormones affect sleep or sleep patterns or any of those um, types, um, which by the way, I can relate to all of them. So what do you do when you're all of them? Maybe that's another question. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else on here feels the same, but um, yeah, just wondering about how hormones affect your sleep and how yeah, they that's those things. That's a great question. And definitely there's a lot of studies that show um, women and, you know, when you're going through different stages in your life, as we know, you know, when we had babies, we, you know, you, you can't sleep when you're pregnant and how that impacts. Um, I think it's just getting you ready to, to not sleep for, the, for a while um, after you have the babies, but also premenopausal, menopausal women, there's lots of um, studies that show how that the hormones affect that. And um, yeah, so I would definitely speak to a family physician to better understand that aspect because it, it is, there's a lot of uh, information out there and depending on your individual needs, it's, it's best to approach it from that perspective. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, at this point, if anybody would like to unmute themselves um, and just have a chat about sleep and um, what your sleep might be like, um, perhaps we could just have a conversation or if you have any other questions for Heather, again, if you're not comfortable with that, just send them through the chat and I will vocalize them for you on your behalf. I, I actually have a question. Heather. Sure. <laughs> I, I think I'm all of the things that you talked about. So that's probably why I'm not getting a good night's sleep. And I have to say that I really appreciate the gratitude that you had mentioned. If you take a moment and just kind of list some things, I think that is so fantastic. And then also the journaling. For me personally, that's what, when I go to sleep, I think I have such a hard time because I'm thinking of my to-do list for the next day. Yeah. So I was thinking, oh my gosh, yeah, maybe if I write it down, That'll alleviate some of the anxiety of all the things that I didn't accomplish today that I need to get done tomorrow. So I really appreciate, like, that was fantastic. My question is, do vitamins play, like, a role? Is there, like, certain times? I take a bunch of vitamins, like, that you should maybe not take certain vitamins because they, like, disrupt your sleep or I don't know. <laughs> That's a, that's a good question. And thank you for the journaling. Yes. I mean, I, I find that, you know, the whole, uh, just to answer the comment on the first part, uh, when you do journal and you're, and like, you know, that you're going to have to journal, you're actually, your mindset is focused on what positive is happening throughout the day. So it actually changes part of your whole anxiety perspective and it kind of gets you into positive mode. And that's sort of, uh, part of the package, right. Is to be aware of what, what positives are happening and that will in fact have a different set of chemicals when we have the, all these thoughts you have different chemicals being released through your body and that actually has a significant impact on your stress response too so and then going back to vitamins that's a really good question i know uh you know melatonin i'm not going to comment on give, taking any specific things but um a lot of uh, like melatonin is a natural um hormone that's obviously produced in the body to help promote sleep um but i you know that's something you would talk to your professional like a healthcare professional about that in more detail but yeah i mean it, i think just vitamins in general if you you were taking it then i think it's just like the time of the day when you're taking them as long as you're not taking your vitamins like close to nighttime where once again it's impacting on the digestion process and taking away from your uh sleep pattern i think it's you know, whatever works for you is good. Great, thank you. Thanks. And then I would like to ask about the chronotype of sleep. So my husband always tells me that because I like to go to sleep late, I yeah. function well in the evening. I like to go to sleep late. I'm okay going to sleep at 1 a.m. or midnight. And then of course, when I have to wake up earlier, then I kind of modify. Yeah. So, and I kind of grew up 
with this uh, premise that the best sleep occurs between, let's say, 11 uh, p.m. and 1 a.m. And I never follow that window. <laughs> so yeah. with the chronotype of sleep, so is it okay to kind of follow your natural biological clock and or whatever it, this is called? No, it was a different um, chronotype, yeah. Yeah, 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 and uh, as long as you are getting certain number of hours of sleep, uh, or like, are you really missing that window between eleven uh, p.m. and? Yeah, so that's an amazing question, Tasha. Thank you for asking that. And yeah, you know, we all have different rhythms, so to speak, and it's it's interesting to to let you know that um, most societies or past societies haven't been monophasic, which is only sleeping at night. A lot of societies are biphasic. If you grew up in the Mediterranean, like I grew up in the Middle East, um, there was siesta time. So work was actually from eight to tw uh, 12. And then we all got off work for like two hours and then you went back to work. And that's same in the, in the Mediterranean, right? So where people actually sleep during the daytime, like it's part of the package of um, the society. And so it's not unusual to have that. And I think that's why it's important to um, really understand if you're getting your hours of sleep, it's fine, whether it's, you know, 11 to 8 or 1 to 9 as, or 1 to 10, as long as you are getting that sleep and you're going through and getting all that, the deep sleep and the REM sleep that you need in order to uh, re-energize and um, recover in general. Um, you know, even athletes, now there are studies that show because when they're always traveling at different locations, if they can get like a power nap and really uh, increase that time, it will not take away from their total recovery. So there's studies that are ongoing and we don't know enough about it, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking if you can do it, because a lot of, I guess, why we say from 11 to seven or whatever it is, it's because a lot of people wake up, you know, and work starts at a certain time and everybody's got to get to that schedule. And if you don't have to, and if you have the ability to wake up a little later, by all means, mm -hmm. uh, if, it's, if it can work for you, why not, right? I wish my husband was here because he's always, <laughs> go to sleep, why are you sleeping at night? I'm like, this is my best time. This is the part of the day when I can actually kind of let the dust settle and enjoy uh, some yeah. time for myself, right? And I just, I love it. And, and also I always, when I study or when I have to do things and really concentrate, it's the night that I can actually do it. So yeah. it's good to know, but, but I also don't, I also get just maybe six, seven hours and it works for me. Perhaps yeah. that's not enough, but I seem to be functioning well with that. So I guess. And and if you're not having sleep problems, then obviously it's working for you, right? Like it's it's a scale. It's between seven to nine hours on average. Mm -hmm. So some people need more, some people need less. But if you're not feeling the effects and you're not tired and groggy and kind of mm -hmm. losing concentration throughout the day, then it's obviously working for you. This Thank is you. for people that are having problems. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I can totally relate, Kasha, because my husband's... Uh, I call him the owl because I'm the lark, right? So we have different chronotypes. And yeah, he'll he'll come in at different times in the night. And I'm I have to like I have to get in there at nine o'clock and start my routine because that's just me. I just I need the early time to get to bed. So just be respectful of everyone, right? <laughs> I think you both talked about so many different points that I think could relate to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just looking in the chat. We don't have any other questions, but what I will do is I'm going to stop recording now um, because perhaps um, you would like to have a conversation um, or um, you'd like to share a thought. Um, um, this would be a good time to do it. So I am just going to let everyone know.